They say revolutionaries don't have no fun. I thought that's what they say. We've been having fun. We've been having fun out here. We waiting on the world to join us. Black and green. It's only revolution, baby. It's only revolution, baby. It's only revolution, baby. Ain't that hard, but you can do it. Ready over there. That's right. It's from a church folk and revolution. You, you know, I don't have the breath for that anymore. You need to get that fixed, honey. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, don't smoke. Cigarettes kill. Uh, welcome to the Revolutionary Road a radio show in beautiful downtown Clearwater. But you don't the smoke. new expanded Tan Talk Network. I'm excited about this because we're actually on FM radio. Woo! As some of our listeners may know, we're on 1340 AM. 13:50 a.m. and 1400 a.m. But now we are also in the Tampa St. Pete Clearwater area on 106.1 FM, 106.1 and 104.3 FM. 104.3. So Call Revolutionary now. Road Radio Show and the other shows on the Tan Talk Network have now expanded to FM radio, which also means that my poor engineer, Mr. Pete. Uh, we're going to have to work extra hard ahead of time whenever we play a uh, <laughs> submedia.tv submedia.tv, uh episode because... Uh, they have a lot of F-bombs. They have a lot of F-bombs, and so we have to be careful about that. Yeah, I was just watching, by the way, right before the show here, the most ridiculous video on YouTube of this parrot. <laughs> it was a cockatoo. A cockatoo uh, cussing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just hilarious. His but owner anyway. was stomping on a cage, and he was cussing him out for doing it. Uh, you know, yeah. bizarreness. Uh, Sounds like a YouTube video well, that's going to you know, get like I, a million views. Yeah, it, it probably, it probably will. has already. And, you know, some people just have all this time on their hands. It's great. I know. It's I pretty sad. I what they have to do. we got to play Pokemon Go. That's oh, right. Go. That's talking right. about oh that. What, 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 what is that? that? What is I the fascination know. with that? Pokemon yeah. Go. What, what do you think, Stephen? What we, about we, Pokemon Go? We have our Go? grandson here. Maybe he has some Come thoughts. Do you have any thoughts on Pokemon Go? For me, Pokemon is sort of uncool. Oh, mm. well, the words Ooh. of wisdom from uh, an eight-year-old. That's why they call this Revolutionary Road Radio. Yeah, even so Pokemon is not cool. But anyway, <laughs> this is the Revolutionary Road Radio Show. And again, as I said, we are now on the FM dial at 106.1, 104.3. Revolutionary Road Radio Show comes to you every Monday night at 10 p.m. on the expanded Tan Talk Network. And we... Uh, also, I want to let you know that this show is podcasted. It is on your TuneIn app on your phone. It's on the World Wide Web. We're live streamed right now. I'm and we're on, on our YouTube channel uh, as well. And you can go to www.tantalk1340.com to get the download, the download on the downloads for the uh, podcasts, for the TuneIn app, for the website. And for the live stream. And then, of course, you can go to YouTube to get the uh, show on YouTube. And also, we have two Facebook sites. Uh, of course, the Revolutionary Road Radio Show on Facebook. And the Friends of Revolutionary Road Radio Show. And I'm glad we have friends. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure we have enemies at this point. We may make more enemies tonight after this show. But the Revolutionary Road Radio Show is... Exactly that. We do not back away from revolutionary, radical, um, really progressive, far left this thought and discussion. Uh, we are not a mainstream show. We may be on a mainstream commercial radio station, but we are not a mainstream show. And if you're looking to sponsor, uh, now is a better time than ever because if you want to advertise or sponsor on this show now you have an expanded audience that includes the fm dial now which may also lead us to play more music here and there because music always sounds better on fm radio than am although i remember growing up listening to some uh, really cool music on am radio but that's when dinosaurs really old, huh? roamed the earth and then dinosaurs no longer roam the earth uh but um we're really excited about the changes happening here. And we also want to give a special shout out to our sponsor. Our main sponsor is St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture, located at 1624 Central Avenue. That's 1624 Central Avenue in St. Pete. St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture offers sliding scale appointments uh, for the best in alternative medicines, particularly uh, acupuncture. Speaking of which, uh, 
I just came uh, earlier in this week from a massage and was much needed. And uh, I hope that that particular group will be joining us as one of our advertisers, and we will be announcing that sometime in the next few weeks. Uh, but again, if you want to be a sponsor for the show, you can call us at 727 278 1547. That's 727 278 1547. Uh, I don't have to tell people what's been going on in the news. Uh, this has been a very uh, tragic tragic week, to say the least. Uh, three different incidences in the last week of African-American men being killed by police. One in Brooklyn, which has not gotten a lot of uh, reporting. Uh, of course, what happened in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and also in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And then on the heels of those shootings, uh, the shootings of police officers in Dallas, uh, Who allegedly... Who are working cooperatively with Black Lives Matter, by the way. Yeah. Allegedly uh, killed by a lone gunman who uh, happened to be African American, and but made it clear in his dialogue with the police that he had nothing to do with Black Lives Matters, even though all over, and I do mean all over social media, there are people trying to blame Black Lives Matters for this uh, tragic shooting that included uh, five deaths of police officers, seven wounded, and as well as a couple of um, uh, people that were in the march. So this is a very, very difficult time in our country. This happens a few weeks after the tragic shootings that occurred in Orlando. And, uh, you know, it, it is truly a, a sad time in our, our country. And it's something that we all need to reflect on. We need to look at the realities of homophobia. We need to look at the realities of racism. And we need to face them head on. It's also a shooting that just happened in Michigan, too. And, in yes. Courthouse. And right. there was, over the weekend, uh, dozens of protests around the country, Black Lives Matters protests. Uh, yours truly participated in one yesterday in St. Petersburg with the National People's Democratic Uhuru Movement a march that happened in the afternoon yesterday in St. Pete. And then on Friday night in Tampa, there was a gathering of Black Lives Matters at a Lutheran Church in Tampa to discuss the future of where we go with this. Uh, during these protests that happened over the weekend, hundreds, uh, the latest number I saw, about 300 Black Lives Matters protesters were arrested. And uh, we see the tensions heightening on a daily basis. So tonight we're going to be having a roundtable discussion with some guests that I don't know if any of them have called in yet. Um, who, who's called in, Pete? We got Connie. We got uh, we got everybody that's needed to call in, called in. So oh, Wonderful. Great. Hi, everyone. Well, um, I want to introduce our guests tonight. Uh, and I think, uh, of course, one of them has no need for introduction, and that's our own Connie B., Connie Burton, who is a housing <laughs> rights activist. Uh, hello, comrade. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank hey, you. Hey, what's up, Connie? And hey. I'm here in the studio with uh, my lovely wife, Barb, and Richard Pete. So uh, they will be joining and asking questions of our guests. Our other guest tonight is the Reverend Charles McKenzie, who is with Rainbow Push Coalition. He is the state director and has been involved in uh, human rights and civil rights activities for many years. He actually ran for Congress uh, for the state legislature, and um, who knows, maybe he'll run again. And then uh, another special guest we have tonight, uh, Deanna Joseph, and I presume her husband will be on with her, Andrew and Deanna Joseph, who are with the Andrew Joseph Foundation. Um, they're, and I'm going to kind of let them tell a little bit of their story. Their 14-year-old son <coughs> died at the hands of Sheriff's Department in Tampa, uh, uh, a year or two ago at the fairgrounds uh, and the police kind of sat by and let this happen and uh, it was a very serious event uh, this unfortunate family has joined the ranks of so many african-american uh, families who have seen their family members die as a result of police misconduct and in many cases wanton open in my opinion anyway and i think the opinion of most who are part of this panel tonight, uh, essentially murder. And uh, I know that's a provocative word to say right now, and there's a lot going on in the press trying to discredit all this kind of stuff. 
But the fact of the matter is that by all accounts, 21st century in the United States, 2016, is now one of the most dangerous times in the history of this country when it comes to race relations and murders of African-American uh, young men, women, and yes, children. Many may know that next Monday uh, begins the Republican Convention. We're going to be giving live coverage from both the Republican and Democratic conventions, particularly of all the protests happening. We're one of the groups involved in helping organize the protests. Many may know that in Cleveland, uh, one of the tragedies of police misconduct has been, in recent memory, the death of Tamir Rice, 12-year-old Tamir Rice, gunned down, gunned down by the Cleveland police. So tonight, our guests are Reverend Charles McKenzie with Rainbow Push Coalition, Deanna Joseph with the Andrew Joseph Foundation, whose 14-year-old son died at the hands of the Sheriff's Department in Tampa, and, of course, our own Connie Burton. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for being on. Uh, I, I do believe we have Connie on, and do we have uh, Charles on as well, Reverend McKenzie? And Deanna, yes. are, are, are you on? Yes. Wonderful. Well, let's begin with Deanna, because uh, this story... When I first found out about it, I, I it was heart wrenching to me. This was, you know, my son just turned eighteen. He's a teenager, and I remember uh, a few years back when Trayvon Martin was killed by that ruthless, ignorant—that's the only word I can use—Zimmerman. Uh, Trayvon Martin was around the same age as my son and his very dear friend, um, who happens to be African American, and I remember his friend's mother uh, being hesitant about letting him visit my son in the neighborhood my son lived in after this happened for fear that some vigilante might shoot him. And it's a feeling that no one ever wants to go through. And Deanna, tell us what happened with your son. Well, um, first of all, thank you for having um, myself as well as my husband, Andrew Joseph, to share our story. Andrew, as you said before, was the 14-year-old. He attended the Florida State Fair on Student Day on February 7, 2014. At this time, uh, Andrew, and along with some of his friends from the neighborhood, carpooled um, with a mother, and um, they were just expecting to have a good time, as, as young kids would do at such an event, at an event that I must say, was geared towards children, students. However, on that particular day, he observed some friends of his being arrested, and that's when he wanted to go up and see if that particular friend was okay. He approached and picked up the hat of one of these young men. He was apprehended by the Hillsborough County Sheriff Deputy. Andrew, explaining that he had done nothing wrong, mattered not to the officers. However, they proceeded in booking him and processing him and photographing him, as in a mugshot photo. Needless to say, in all of his sharing of demographic information, his address, his phone number, no one in that department felt the need to call the parent. At that point, they loaded Andrew and um, uh, many of his friends, as well as um, 99 other kids, into a sheriff paddy wagon and abandoned them on Orient Road, which was a dark road that Andrew was not familiar with, nor was he familiar with that neighborhood. In Andrew's attempt to find his way back to safety, he was hit and killed on I-4. The 19-year-old who killed Andrew was never given a drug test or an alcohol test. And the Florida Highway Patrol at that point indicated that there was no probable cause. However, two weeks later, the same young boy is stealing big screen TVs out of Walmart. But his DNA is drawn. He's given 45 days in jail. He's given one year of shoplifting classes, one year of drug and alcohol classes. And I thought to myself, I said, wow. He received so many consequences for stealing big screen televisions out of Walmart, but nothing for killing my son. 
I filed, as well as my husband, filed a grievance with the Florida Highway Patrol in, in their office in Tallahassee. And they came back with a report that their corporal had not followed policies and procedures. And the slap in the face at that point was that the consequence he received for not following policy and procedure was that he read the handbook, and now he understands the, the process. So you look at the, the criminal justice system and you look at the legal entities, and they're all responsible in this complicit behavior, um, whether it be in caring for our children, whether it be in exercising due process, whether it be in providing all aptitudes of the law, they somehow tend to look the other way when it comes to a life of a black person. And it, it's, it's happening all over the world, and it's very uh, discouraging at times because in every corner, in every part of the world, people are crying out, saying that enough is enough. And the, they're trying to have our voices heard, but each and every time we have law enforcement and we have politicians who are trying to censor this voice and saying, what you're thinking, what you're saying does not matter and it's not that bad. So we're, we're on this fight and it's been two years and like you said, it's been a tragic week, but it's been a tragic week for us because we, we're still in this fight and we have yet to receive any justice. We have yet to receive any names of the police officers who kidnapped our kid, because in essence, that's what it was. You know, we can play with words today, and when the news says he was unjustly ejected, well, if you look in ejection up in the dictionary, that means to take without consent. That means to, to take away. That means to kidnap, to, to apprehend. And, and that's what happened. He was apprehended. He was captured. And um, upon their photographing of him, he was then abandoned on a dark road as if he was an animal. Well, I, you know, there's no words to express what a parent feels, especially when a life is cut short unnecessarily and unjustly. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded of the three young uh, black teenagers, uh, young women, that recently died at the hands of a high-speed chase that the sheriff's department in Pinellas County was involved in and drowned with the police claiming they couldn't do anything but that same uh, police officer, one of the officers involved, rescued a dog in much deeper water. And it begs the question, are animals now in our culture worth more than black lives? That's why Black Lives Matters is important as a movement, and you know there's much more we can get into, but I, I think all too often we try to give pat answers to those who have experienced this loss, this kind of loss, and we don't want to hear the pain of those. It mm -hmm. reminds me of, of the woman who was sharing, the girlfriend of the gentleman who was killed in Minneapolis that was caught on uh, video on her phone and her four-year-old having, to, I think it was a four-year-old daughter, having to witness this man being gunned down in his own vehicle by the police in front of the daughter and the girlfriend. And you ask yourself, how can this barbaric kind of behavior happen at the hands of people who wear uniforms? Are we dealing really with armed thugs that carry a badge? What is, you know... We hear the word thugs used all the time in a very derogatory, racist manner about black people. But really, are we dealing with a law enforcement situation now where many of police behave like they're armed thugs? So I want to go next to Connie, and then uh, we're also going to talk with Reverend McKenzie and uh, continue our dialogue, too, with Deanna. But Connie, uh, tell me what your thoughts are. I just believe it's a um, full pattern and practice of uh, what black folks have experienced uh, throughout America since the time we've been kidnapped and captured. You know, we've had historians document, you know, almost 400 years of oppression. Uh, we've had uh, people that have been advocating to end this oppression, 
Uh, we've had, whether it was Nat Turner uh, at the tender age of 31 years old, uh, seek out a rebellion uh, to uh, expose it and to free our people, uh, whether it was during the 1963 where Dr. King in his wonderful book, uh, Why We Can't Wait, talked about the Negro Revolution in the 60s, up until what we see now, the uh, the transformation of young people being thrown into political life, and has made a determination that they are they are willing to shape the foundation of this society to end this increase in injustice. So, you know, I think we are living in a very uh, you know tense but unique period in which we have an opportunity to rewrite history. And uh, it might uh, prove uh, even dangerous at times, but as an African woman with sons and grandsons and somebody who want to leave a better legacy, you know, I don't want to talk about, you know, all the time of oppression and oppression and grief. I want to be able to say, you know, in my lifetime, we was able to conquer and accomplish uh, the highlight of justice. And I think it's possible to do that. It's going to take a tremendous amount of work. It's going to be some uncomfortable uh, battles in that, but I think it can be done. I mean, like, again, human history uh, uh, show us the possibility. We even just think back to the Vietnam era when we've seen so many atrocities and, and murder and slaughter of the Vietnamese people. Now we find the United States in dialogue and in trade and in a better relationship. So the point being is that, yes, we're in a, a trying period, but I do believe that uh, with struggle, we can get where we need to get. Well, thank you, Connie. Um, Reverend Charles McKenzie, of course, uh, I know quite well and is no stranger to activism and fighting for civil rights uh, as the state chair of Rainbow Push Coalition, which is an organization founded many years ago by uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson. Um, Reverend McKenzie, Charles, what are your feelings at this time? What, 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 what's your assessment of what's going on? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on the show with... Uh, individuals like uh, Mrs. Joseph and her husband and Connie Burton who are fighting for justice and are doing the kinds of things that I believe are necessary to push our communities and our nation to a new place. I'm very disturbed by what I have seen and heard in terms of unarmed black men and boys being gunned down like beasts with no concern for the fact that their lives have been dehumanized. I think it was tragic what happened in Dallas with the five policemen. But I think we as a society must come to terms with the fact that if we're going to really come to a place where people of this society, and particularly people of African descent and brown and yellow people and red people feel that it is a society that really means what it says when it talks about equal protection under the law and equal access and equal opportunity and fair share, that it must act with equal dispatch when it comes to prosecuting law enforcement officers who murder people and do it blatantly in front of other human beings and they're just placed on administrative leave and sometimes administrative leave with pay this is an absolute insult it is completely insensitive it is it's incomprehensible that such thing would be done the police officers who died died tragically but their deaths were no more tragic than these black men and boys who are being gunned down. And we have to have the same vigor and the same thorough attempt to get to the bottom of their deaths and the tragedy that happened around Mrs. Joseph's son 
as we do police officers. We have a tendency in this society to deify police officers, and the very people who are supposed to uphold the law are treated sometimes as though they are above the law. And it goes really beyond black and white, because the officers who were involved in the tragedy in Philadelphia were both black and white. I believe that the gentleman involved in the shooting in Minneapolis was Hispanic. So it's even beyond race, it's a culture, a militaristic culture, where police forces around the country are forces of occupation utilized by the powers to be to contain those elements in society they consider to be less or undesirable. So I'm very disturbed because we live in a society that boasts of things that it does not live up to. And Dr. King again was right. All we said to America is be true to what you said on paper. So that's where I am regarding these incidents and things that continue to happen. But as Connie stated, maybe we're at a place now where people will begin to realize that Frederick Douglass was right. Where there is no struggle, there is no progress. You know, I don't recall a time in my lifetime, other than the 60s, and I was just a child then, uh, where we have seen this kind of uh, violence, this kind of uprising, this kind of anger happening. And some have said it is the pressure valve finally got to the point where it exploded and people, and I'm referring particularly those in the African community, but really... Uh, people of color in general, are tired, fed up and tired of the oppression that they have faced at the hands of the police state. And that includes everything from law enforcement on the street to the court system to the prison industrial complex that now incarcerates more people than combined than any nation on the planet, including China, the majority of whom are black and brown people. And uh, I know writers such as and professors such as M Michelle Alexander have brought that out in in her book the new Jim Crow uh, when we look at this kind of situation and, and I, I guess I'm leaving it up to uh, all three of you uh, and certainly Deanna your husband Andrew if he would like to comment all of our guests on the show tonight to comment on uh, what what is it, you know, th there's a statistic that said since Obama became president, hate groups multiplied by hundreds of percentage points. Um, and some have said that this pl this time and the, the, the killing, not only by police, but by white hate groups of people of color parallels the Jim Crow period. And I, I guess I'm throwing it open to all three of our guests uh, to maybe, how does this make you feel? You know, I, I'm, I'm white, okay? And while I may have had my share of some difficult things in life, I've been homeless before, for instance, I still have benefited from the fact that there is still white privilege. All things being equal, when I was homeless, it was more likely for a black homeless person lying next to me on the streets to be oppressed by the police to the extent that they were as opposed to myself. So I've benefited from this, you know, I have not, and, and, and our, our co-hosts here and even our home church that Barbara and I are involved in have not hesitated to acknowledge white privilege. I will never understand what it's like when a mother has to have that talk or a father has to have that talk with their children and with their teenagers about, well, listen, when you go out there, you got to be careful. You got to watch how you behave, not just around people in general, but around police. Help us understand, help the, the listening audience to understand why it's so important that we look at this issue of white privilege, why it's so important that we look at this issue of why there has to be a Black Lives Matters, not just a All Lives Matters. Uh, any one of our guests, please. Uh, I can... yeah, this, uh, this is Andrew. I'm uh, the father of Andrew Joseph III. And, you know, just to answer your question, let me take, say uh, thank you and, and welcome to everybody that's listening. And thanks for the, uh, the platform that's been offered to share our stories and to share our concerns. It's, uh, it's a beautiful thing in the community. <clears throat> but, uh, I mean, you have to understand that, first of all, that we're dealing with the police. 
And that's the you know that's that's that's, that's the ultimate goal right now because racism is the biggest problem in the world. You know, it's bigger than cancer. It's bigger than any sickness, Ebola. It's killing more people, you know, around the world than than any other problem. And this is a problem that has never been solved, and really has never been really confronted. It's, it's been the elephant in the room that everybody tap dance around. And 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 in the times that we're in now, it's it's the sign of the time. It's, you know, it's this time. It's, it's written. It's supposed to happen. It's it's, it's supposed to be fathers that's bearing. As burying their sons, and it's supposed to be—it's supposed to be hard to tell the difference between the men and the women, and the children are supposed to be running the world. It's—it's it's, it's that time, and you know we got to realize that we're in our last hour. And, you know, not to quote the Bible, but to, uh, just to make reference, you know, there was a a guy that we called Jesus that was on the cross that was being crucified, and there was a man next to him that was able to be saved. You know, in the last hour. And that's where we are now when it comes to, you know, to white folks, because you, you, we all are on the cross. And it's time for you to, 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 to make right what your forefathers had done wrong, you know? It's, it's time to correct the mistakes of your forefathers. And, 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 and it's absolutely necessary, because as it stands right now, you know, my 14-year-old, it's the, it's the hardest thing in the world to have to go to the graveyard to visit my son. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a a ten year old daughter at the time. She's twelve now, and uh, we, we we had to buy this little girl a, a therapy dog because she had just she had just lost her brother, her mentor, her her, her hero. Mm-hmm. And so we brought a little therapy dog just to kind of uh, give us some money to run around with. And you know, the little dog has done wonders for our family, but uh, the dog messes up the carpet from time to time, so she spends a lot of time on the, uh, on the back screen porch. Now, right now, yeah, right now as an advocate dog owner, I couldn't take my dog out my back screen porch and put my dog in my truck and transport my dog up to the front street, where they told me, and you know, and, and abandon this dog. And me being an advocate dog owner, I can, I can, I, I would give this dog a bowl of water and some food before I abandon this dog and spray this dog. And if I go back to my house and sit down and watch TV, and 15 or 20 minutes later. This dog runs out in the street and gets hit by a car. The state of Florida is bamming on my door behind animal cruelty. But yet you're telling me that, you know, in 2016, my 14-year-old don't have the right of a dog. Because, you know, that's exactly what happened to him. They kidnapped him. They took him out the safety of the fairground, the yard, and put him in the official police car and transported him away from the fair and abandoned him. A hundred yards from the interstate, hmm. and, 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 and you know it's two years later, and we don't even have a police report. And he, they not only did that to my son, but to ninety-nine other kids. And we haven't heard one word from this sheriff's department, who's who's operating with immunity, because there's nobody that's over this sheriff. You know, he's he's he 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 outranks the mayor, and, and the FDL the FDLE can't touch him, and nobody's over this sheriff except. Except the governor, who told me personally that he don't get involved in, in, in local matters. Mm-hmm. Uh, we stuck here, you know, two years afterwards, and he hasn't given us one sentence. So he released 99 kids on side of the interstate without even a phone call to a parent. Not a letter that went out two weeks later, anything. You know, we don't have to go all the way to Dallas to, to look for this kind of stuff. We don't have to go to Ferguson. We don't. We don't. We, we don't have to be. In Chicago, it's right here in Tampa, and it exists for and, many, many, many years with this fact. Can I state this to uh, Bruce? That is, it's not just um, say the murder. Uh, how do we explain how to behave? It is a system of oppression yes. that you start explaining to your child early on. Not how just they interact with the police, but how they act in school so don't, so they don't get sold into the arms of the system. Uh, how do they act when they go to the mall or uh, uh, if they're in the car with their friends and if they're laughing and listening to their music and how that might affect white people and their reaction to uh, young people that has been uh, labeled as thugs, super predators, uh, grants 
grants have been written to uh, weed out these elements of human beings that uh, even our own government is a, is not fit for a housing benefit, uh, medical assistance, and on and on. So as an African woman, what it does is that it chips away at our dignity. Uh, when we are not able to defend our children and defend our culture and our neighborhoods, when we are in a constant battle uh, to survive, uh, you know, just from every day and then, you know, try to give our children some hope that somehow this America can turn itself around on its own and somehow they would be the beneficiary of, 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 of that impact. But, you know, right now we are living in a period that irregardless of class within inside the African community, what got us connected now is our skin color. Uh, the fact that we are, uh, you know, part of the uh, Negro race, uh, that we are a descendant of Africa. And it has been a clear uh, line drawn, a great division inside of America that uh, has making people choose uh, what side will they be on. We are being forced now as African people to recognize that our survival is going to be on the survival of all. It ain't going to be no um, middle-class survival, a lower-class survival, or the rich think they can escape this uh, type of attack. But this is going to be a uniting of African people to show that we are one people, and the survival of all of us is going to be based on our struggle to uh, fight the win. Well, you know, it's almost... Uh difficult to interrupt here but i'm going to take a brief break to let people know about some things going on in the area but when we come back i want to hear back from uh or hear from reverend mckenzie as well as his thoughts on this and uh, of course uh deanna andrew and and uh, connie and further thoughts they may have but i want to let people know that uh this show the revolutionary road radio show comes to you every monday night at 10 p.m thanks to Uh, People like St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture, uh, who is one of our sponsors, they're located at 1624 Central Avenue in St. Pete, offering sliding scales of uh, scale appointments. You can call 727-823-1700. This show is produced by Squatter Productions, The Refuge, and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. If you want to sponsor or underwrite our show, you can call us at 727 278-1547 278-1547 and as was mentioned at the beginning of the show this uh, show can be heard on the World Wide Web podcasted or on your tuning app on your phone by going to www.tantalk1340.com you can also check out our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook and as we mentioned at the beginning this show has now got an expanded uh, radio audience we are now on the FM dial as well at 106.1 FM and 104.3 FM, as well as the AM stations that uh, you have heard us speak of before. And uh, we want to let you know about a couple things coming to the area. Uh, There is a benefit show happening Wednesday night at Rock Park in Madeira Beach uh, for uh, Refuge Ministries of Tampa Bay and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. It's the Summerland Tour sponsored by Phoenix Productions and The Refuge. And it features Everclear, um, Sugar Ray Sponge, and uh, Lit. And that's at 6 6 p.m. at Rock Park in Madeira Beach. If people are interested in tickets, call 727-278-1547. We do have some tickets that we will give away to you tonight if you call us after uh, 1130 at that number, 727-278-1547. Also coming to the area is... um, Of course, the usual Wednesday night um, movies at St. Petersburg for Peace, and that's at 6 p.m. And the film uh, this uh, Wednesday at Community Cafe at, I'm sorry, 7 p.m. on Wednesday is The Company You Keep. Uh, We also want to let you know that Food Not Bombs is having a special planning meeting tomorrow night. Food Not Bombs is an organization that feeds homeless folks. Uh, and is built on the premise of feeding people rather than supporting the notion of bombing people in war. And uh, tomorrow night at St. Petersburg Community Acupuncture at 8.30 will be a meeting that you can call 727-278-1547. I want to let people know also that we will be doing live coverage of this Monday night at the Republican Convention, 
We will be involved in organizing demonstrations and protests with a number of organizations from around the country, and we will be giving live coverage on the Revolutionary Road next Monday at 10 p.m. And then uh, the following Monday at 10 p.m., we will be on the air at the Democratic Convention in Philly, and we will be giving uh, live coverage there and letting people know about uh, everything that's going on there. Um, And uh, we uh, want you to know that uh, throughout the week, there is a plan to be calling into one of the uh, morning shows on this station, uh, and we'll let you know uh, what show that'll be uh, through our emails and web and Facebook postings and social media, uh, giving live reports daily from both conventions. And speaking of which, uh, as we are looking at the conventions, particularly the Republican convention, there is talk uh, in Uh, social media, and in other formats around the country of uh, revenge. And we we hate to be mentioning this, but it is a reality now that there are a number of white supremacist and hate groups that unfortunately have gotten behind the candidacy of Donald Trump because of his, I'll be honest with you, racist rhetoric. Um, It's something that everybody knows and very few people want to deal with and acknowledge. And there is talk of taking revenge on Protesters, there is talk of taking revenge on Black Lives Matters, uh, members who will be doing demonstrations in Cleveland, and it's been all over social media. It is amazing to me how the life of a police officer when they pass away is so much more of value than the lives of black and brown people, and that's what we've been discussing tonight is that reality. And so as we get back to the show and our guests, um, I wanted to know what... uh, our guests think about and maybe reflect on this growing culture of uh, hatred that's not just at the hands of the police and what they have done, but really a, a growing number of people in the white community that are getting behind uh, the horrific kinds of thinking and thoughts that we are seeing emerge from white supremacist groups and, yes, from the Trump campaign. So uh, whoever would like to maybe say something about that, feel free to address it. Well, I think, Bruce, that as it relates to the Trump phenomenon, what we're seeing is nothing new. It's the white backlash, and it is something that has always been often just below the surface, and it just takes some kind of an event or some kind of an individual to bring all that bottom feeding to the top. So... That is really nothing new. We're, those of us who have been involved in the struggle and know the lessons of history realize that. Now, I wanted to say also, as it relates to something that uh, Sister Burton said earlier, that Dr. King addressed toward the end of his life something he called reaching a point in the black community where we realize that no Jeffersonian document, no Lincolnian signature, none of those kinds of things could do for us what we must do for ourselves, but we must, with the pen and ink of self-determination, reach deep within and write our own Emancipation Proclamation. So there is a real case for us beginning to see that we have common problems, a common nemesis, and we have to come together as the old folk used to say, every frog ought to praise his own pond. I do think also, and I think uh, that uh, the guests would agree, that those who are willing to work with us, we want them to work with us, and we don't turn away anybody who wants to fight with us in our righteous cause. I was in, I'm in Washington, D.C. now, and I saw a Black Lives Matter demonstration in front of the White House yesterday. And in that group were young African Americans and whites and Latinos and Arabs, just a whole plethora of people who I believe are conscientious and see the handwriting on the wall. John Kennedy said this, those who make peaceful resolutions impossible make violent confrontation inevitable. And I'm really afraid that our country 
if it does not come to terms with itself, is in for more cataclysmic things that are going to happen. And finally, I want to say, I know about Denmark V.C. and Nat Turner, and God rest their souls and what they tried to do for African people under the chains of chattel slavery. But I also remember John Brown and others who have fought with us across the spectrum over the years. We cannot depend on others for our liberation. We must fight to liberate ourselves. <clears throat> but those who are willing to work with us, who welcome their help, and want them to work with us against those forces that, quite frankly, work against them as well. Deanna, do you have some thoughts? Yes, my, my thought would be that in in my life, I've, I've very seldom um, needed the support of the police department. And in this particular instance, when I needed them the most to protect my 14-year-old son, they did not. And to hear the response of the colonel and his saying that we are not babysitters, hmm. it, 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 it's heartbreaking. It, it brings me to the place where as I, I, I'm baffled by the whole issue of, yes, all lives matter, but where was the security and safety for these children? Where was the safety and security for my little boy on um, that particular day, that Friday at the school fair? And because of that, you know, we, we continue to carry forth this legacy of this little boy because not many people know the true story because the media never told the true story. Okay. So that's why we are um, scheduling what we would say a documentary screening of the life and death of Andrew Joseph III on July 23rd at 1.30 at the Robert Sanders Library. So we're hoping that the listening audience as well as everyone who uh, share a concern will come out and view this film, and you will all know that our desires for our child was no different from any other parent, and that we wanted the best for him, and we did uh, desire him to live a full life, just like any other American family in, in this world. Well, could you um, give that information again, because I think it'd be very important. You know, we hear statistics, we hear numbers, but behind those statistics and numbers are people. People whose families have been impacted by their deaths. And I think it's so important what you are planning on doing, uh, Deanna and Andrew, for people to be aware of it and to come out. So if you would one more time share that information with us. July 23rd, that is a Saturday at 1.30 p.m., there will be a documentary screening on the life and the death of Andrew Joseph III. That will be at Robert Saunders Public Library at 1505 North Nebraska Avenue, Tampa, Florida, 33602. Well, thank you for that. And, and how can people find out about your foundation, by the way? You can go to our website, andrewjosephfoundation.org. And there will be a listing of different events and places we've gone and how you as um, community, as people, can help. Connie, you know, in having this discussion tonight, I guess to some extent people in our country are maybe desensitized, maybe overwhelmed, uh, maybe any number of other things and it, it seems like the more this stuff happens the more uh, the shock factor seems to diminish among some people certainly n not amongst the uh, black community and particularly people that have been very involved in the Black Lives Matters movement but uh, certainly uh, if uh, Deanna and Andrew and and Charles, Reverend Car Charles McKenzie want to comment, they can as well. But Connie, uh, what do you think is going on with the collective consciousness of this country as far as are we waking up or 
I mean, it just seems like every time you turn around, there's more and more of this tragic stuff going on and more and more of the power structure trying to ignore or defend what's going on. Well, I think this thing called privilege is getting in the way of white people uh, being able to get in touch with their humanity. And the unfortunate, you know, uh, part of, about that is that uh, the human spirit and the human body is, is, is one thing. You know, like uh, we bleed blood. Uh, we got two eyes, two ears, and, and our physical makeup uh, based on our uh, uh, human DNA is the same. But this false sense of superiority that white people have, they are fighting like hell to hold on to it all over the world. All over the world, they are attempting to always uh, uh, put themselves first and, and in the center of everybody's business. And the good part about that is that some people uh, in this world has rejected that. And I believe in America, this is the last stronghold of containing and controlling black people. And, and, and they need this. Because if we start unraveling and dismantling all of the false notions that help them to get where they at, then they have to come face to face as to who they are. And, and, and that's something I believe that people reject. That's why we see from generation to generation this same nastiness of racism continue. I mean, uh, it's, it, it has to be a taught culture. It has to be taught. And so uh, people in their preservation are remaining on top, of uh, being superior to other humans. This is what I believe that is a driving force. Uh, you see uh, uh, white people uh, become very sensitive when we talk about the uh, return of a soldier, the flying of the, uh, the, the uh, a flag half mask, uh, when a police officer uh, anybody that's protecting their interest is murdered or killed in war. So now that we're talking about Black Lives Matter, they can't hear that because they know that those entities and bodies of government that has fought to preserve their uh, power uh, is, is now under attack. And so they have made, many of them have made a conscious decision that they would rather... Uh, uh, know themselves from the truth than accepting it and dealing with it. Reverend McKenzie, what do you think? Well, I think uh, what Connie just said needs to be recorded. I think she was very eloquent. I think she was very much on point. Uh, privileged classes do not give up their privileges voluntarily. They must be demanded by the oppressed. And Sometimes that involves violence and bloodshed, unfortunately. Uh, she's absolutely right that there are large segments of white society who want to hold on to this ignorant, unscientific notion of being superior to people of color. There's no basis for it in science, no basis for it in anthropology, no basis for it in morality, but they want to hold on to it. And so they've made an effort, a conscious effort, to live that lie and believe that untruth. Uh, I did want to also say this, that I appreciate you and the fight that you put forward to help black people and to help homeless people and those who are suffering. And I want to applaud the Josephs for continuing their fight for their son and Connie for continuing her fight to raise the consciousness of our people and bring us to a place where we realize that this is a fight that has not ended. Uh, I'm writing a book, and I hope to have it published within the ne next six months to a year, the title of which is Why We Can't Rest. Uh, because people ask that question, why is it that it seems we continue to fight these same battles over and over again? We cannot rest because the forces that are against us will not rest. In the end, the tragedy will be that we discover, if we don't wake up, that we killed each other, and we'll realize we had more in common than that which separates us. The 
Deanna or Andrew or both, what are your thoughts? Okay, and in closing, yes, um, we wanted to also say thank you to um, Ms. Connie Burton. She was the first one uh, holding the sign, fighting for justice for Andrew before we even knew anything about holding a sign, fighting for justice. And for that, we are forever grateful um, that she was raising raising awareness and letting them know that what they did to Andrew was, was wrong and uh, someone needed to answer for that. So I did want to mention that on, on today. Um, going forward, uh, Mr. Joseph would like to give... Just want to... Uh... Let everybody know that, you know, we fight this fight because we don't want another set of parents to have to stand in these shoes. And, uh, you know, it's, the, it's, it, 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 it's a struggle like like beyond words. So, you know, just take the opportunity to uh, to love your children, keep them close. We're living in a, a real strange and difficult time right now. And every time those kids leave the house, it's just, uh, it's just a blessing for them to, to return back home. Mm -hmm. because, you know. Because tomorrow's, tomorrow's not promised. Yes. So take the opportunity to hug your kids, and turn the television off, and take those earbuds out of their ears, and sit down and have a Sunday dinner, take pictures, and take vacations, and spend quality time. Because, you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is, uh, today is the present. It's, it's, and it's really a present, because tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow is, is a question mark at this point. Well, I'm sitting here with my grandson and, and looking at him, and you know, because we're white, I don't, I don't have to think along some of the same lines that uh, grandparents and parents of African children have to. And you know, I I can't imagine how people don't understand that there is a difference between us in terms of that. Um, and I, my heart goes out to you, Deanna and Andrew. I, you know, I can't even. There's no words. I mean, I, I don't know. No parent should have to bury their child. That's all I can say. And, you know, we all wake up either here or in glory, but it doesn't mean that we don't miss those that we lose. And, you know, the senseless killings of these kids is just, it, this is our future. Yeah. And I feel like our future is being exterminated. And, and I can't even begin to say, you know, um, how that makes me feel, even as a white person. So I can't even imagine being African and having to deal with it. So, again, my heart's with you. That's all I can say. Well, I want to thank everyone again for being on our show, our guests, including uh, our, our co sometime co-host and uh, housing rights and just people's rights activist, Connie Burton. And my savior. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Reverend Charles McKenzie with Rainbow Push Coalition. And, of course, um, Deanna and Andrew Joseph with the Andrew Joseph Foundation in honor of their 14-year-old son who died at the hands mm -hmm. of law enforcement. And... My sometime co-host, Richard Pete, who did not get the opportunity to share anything tonight, but I know has much to share on the rights of people, particularly homeless folks. And that was not reported in the news either, by the way, about the homeless folks that died a week ago last Sunday in San Diego, a uh, brutal murder of two homeless folks and two others who were injured by someone uh, who mm, espoused hate against homeless people and actually set one of them on fire. This is the times in which we li live in, and it is truly tragic. This is why our show, the Revolutionary Road Radio Show, is so important, why we're grateful to be on the Tan Talk Network, including their new expanded uh, FM dial of things, 106.1 FM and 104.3. When we come back next week, uh, we will be reporting live from the Republican National Convention. We will be reporting outside the convention with the protests happening at the Republican convention, as well as the following Monday at the Democratic convention, uh, including daily reports that will happen uh, on shows on this station, as well as uh, on Facebook, live uh, via social media throughout the week. Thank you for listening to Revolutionary Road Radio Show. Let's go, yo. Let's go. 
Broken dreams is the catalyst. Stand equipped, take care to sow the seeds. Who grow the trees? Fight in the knowledge you've drowned in their courage. Wait to fill in their bosses' boots, but lose their leaves.